Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing fine, thank you very much, and I'm so delighted you've joined me for our story tonight. Go and get yourself something lovely to drink, and we're about to start. But before we do, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up, and let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, 16-year-old Sam had lackadaisically dozed off on his Aunt Beth's very comfortable white leather couch, which felt like being on a bed. It was so sumptuously cosy. Indeed, everything about the glamorous layout and decor of the Valinsky's very stunning all-wooden home that rather resembled a bewitching Swiss chalet, overlooking prepossessing views of heavily forested countryside, was always so warmly welcoming to the young teenager. Sam always felt as if he was on a weekend retreat whenever he stayed with both his uncle and aunt. The house had been built and designed fastidiously by the Valinskys themselves, with no expense spared, but then again they were reasonably well off, so they could easily afford what Sam would describe as the benefits of enjoying the good life, without having to worry very much about the crippling debt that afflicted so many. Aunt Beth had married a very wealthy entrepreneur, and had never ever looked back. But at the same time, she had also never forgotten her humble roots, and was well aware of the privileges that blessed her life, that gave her so many opportunities that others so sadly lacked. Sam's parents, who both lived and worked in Detroit, were not as fortunate financially, and often struggled to pay the bills on time. But Aunt Beth would always insist on giving Sam's mother cash handouts whenever she could, as she was very close to her older sister and knew all too well what it was like to struggle, having experienced hardships when she was growing up herself. Aunt Beth had been raised in a very modest home in the Tennessee mountains, with two devoted parents and her sister Julie. What the family had lacked in money, they more than made up in love, as both Beth and Julie had been blessed with childhoods that were so close to perfect, well, as close as you could get, that is. Aunt Beth was very humble, and knew a great deal about living hand to mouth, she never wanted her opulent prosperity to diminish her character in any way and turn her into a spoilt, self-entitled brat. She would always say to Sam's mother, It's a gift to be able to help you, Julie. That's the way I see it. If one has more money than one needs, then you help other people, don't you? Sam enjoyed spending the occasional rather frivolous, decadent weekend at the Valinsky's house. They were incredibly good to him. They spoiled him generously, bought him trendy gifts, and treated him as if he was their beloved older son. Mr. Valensky, his uncle, paid for Sam's education at an expensive school in Detroit, as his parents could not afford the school fees there. So Sam believed he was rather indebted to the Valenskys for their kindness towards him, something that his mother never ever let him forget. The Valensky's house was called Point of View, surrounded with luxurious comforts you would find in a grand hotel, including a sauna and a hot tub. The Valenskys obviously enjoyed pampering themselves. Aunt Beth's refrigerator was stuffed to the brim with expensive top-of-the-range food that Sam would never find at home, because on the one hand his mother was not remotely domesticated, nor could she afford to splash out on expensive food labels. Let's just say, in their modest suburban home in Detroit... Sam would always have to help himself to the predictable stale bread and mouldy old cheese in the refrigerator, along with any leftovers from the previous night, which was also terribly unexciting and predictable, unless, of course, his mother had ordered a Chinese takeaway the night before. Mrs. Valensky's fridge was another world in itself, galaxies away from the fridge at home, as it boasted French champagne a range of interesting drinks including cinnamon coca-cola, cherry aid and club cream soda. There were exotic yogurts, delicious salamis and gourmet meats, honey-glazed ham, truffles, caviar, smoked mussels, black squid ink pasta, interesting sauces and salads, so it was always good staying with the Valinskys. It was a gastronomic experience to say the very least. Sam had only intended to close his eyes for a few brief seconds on this unassuming Saturday evening, when he was babysitting for the Valenskys. But he soon realised he must have been asleep for a while longer than he'd actually envisaged. 
well, a lot longer, actually. It seemed like a couple of hours had slipped by, as fast as butter melting away on a warm crumpet. The carriage clock on the mantel over the fireplace registered ten past ten. Goodness gracious me, it really was rather late. How long had he been asleep for? He had not even checked up on his cousin Billy. For the last three hours or so, it would seem. A sense of self-condemning shame washed over him, for if his Aunt Beth were to see him now, she'd be bitterly disappointed in him. Sam had faithfully assured his mother's pedantic older sister, Aunt Beth, that no, of course, he wouldn't fall asleep while watching over his little seven-year-old cousin Billy. "'You may think I'm fussy, Sam,' Aunt Beth had told her nephew, in a very matter-of-fact voice. "'But I just can't help myself. I hate being away from little Billy, even for a second. I'm so dreadfully protective over him. I see other mothers, you know, behaving so nonchalantly towards their own children. But I'm sorry. I just can't be that easy going about taking care of my son. It's a full-time responsibility, let me tell you, that I take very, very seriously indeed. It only takes a second for things to go badly wrong. I'm painfully only too well aware of that fact. From bitter experience, of course. When Billy gets older, I will loosen my formidable cast-iron hold over him. But at this stage of his life, kids can get into so much trouble. It's so easy for a child to put their hand by mistake in a waste disposal unit. Or get a burn from putting their hand in a bowl of boiling jam. The list goes on and on. You need to have eyes in the back of your head when you're minding children, as young as Billy. I can understand, Aunt Beth, why you're so devoted to little Billy. He's a lovely boy. Sweetheart, Billy is the only child I will ever have. I hope you realise that. It was an absolute miracle I had him at all, if you must know. When I fell pregnant with Billy... My gynaecologist at the time assured me that I was physically completely incapable of conceiving. So me and your Uncle Dylan had resigned ourselves to never having children on our own, and that was desperately hard for the both of us, let me tell you. That must have been tough for you, Aunt Beth. You would have been a brilliant mother because you are a brilliant mother. That's very kind of you to say, dear. Tough doesn't begin to describe it, though, Sam. There are no words. Me and your Uncle Dylan wanted children very badly, with all of our hearts we did. It was our absolute dream to have at least over four children. When I heard I'd never be able to conceive or have children of my own, it pretty much destroyed me. You can ask your mother all about that. Your mother, Julie, knows how many times I would phone her in the middle of the night, crying my heart out about how grievously unfair it was that I would remain childless for the rest of my life. Your poor mother had to put up with all my despair, but she held me up in very difficult, tumultuous times, let me tell you. She was the best older sister I could have ever asked for. Do you know she even offered to have a baby for me and Dylan, which was such a generous thing for her to do. I was so incredibly humbled by her kindness. My mother offered to have a baby for you. I asked, sounding confounded. She did indeed, said Aunt Beth. I suppose she never told you that. You see how special your mother is. She was selflessly generous. I was tempted to accept that offer, you know. I would have given anything to have a child. But shortly after your mother had volunteered to have a baby for me, one day I'd miraculously discovered I was pregnant. Even the gynaecologist said it was an absolute miracle. I do recall how confounded his face was. He was utterly astonished and called the nursing staff in the room to see the scans. They couldn't believe it either. But yes, I was pregnant. Well, that's incredible, Aunt Beth. You must have been so happy about that. Well, actually, I was more fearful than happy, Sam. I couldn't predict, you see, how my pregnancy would ultimately go. You see, I was so desperately afraid that I wouldn't be able to carry Billy to full term, or that I might have a spontaneous miscarriage. I wasn't out of the woods yet. My gynaecologist had made that perfectly clear to me. If the truth be told, I don't think my gynaecologist was very optimistic about a positive outcome. 
He was negative throughout my whole pregnancy. But when your little nephew was born, it was without doubt the happiest day of my entire life. Me and your Uncle Dylan were like two kids who'd broken into a candy store and stolen all the best sweets. We couldn't stop smiling, to such an extent that our jaws began to ache. I've never had a problem like that. A painful jaw, I mean, because I was smiling so much. Let's just say when Willie was born, he was a bundle of joy. I couldn't take my eyes off him. I was completely smitten. I knew I was the luckiest woman in the entire world that came so close to not having a baby at all. I hope you can understand that, Sam. Why Billy means so desperately much to me. He is my miracle child that I cannot afford to ever take for granted for one second. You need to make absolutely sure, Sam, you watch over him like a hawk for me while we're away on Saturday night. Do you think you can do that for me? I'm putting all my trust in you. I know it's a big responsibility to undertake, but do you think you can do it? You don't have to worry, Aunt Beth, about a single thing. I'll take great care of little Billy, I promise you. I'll read him a very nice bedtime story to keep him entertained. I'll tuck him up in bed. I'll give him his dinner at five o'clock sharp. You've given me his timetable, and I promise you I'll follow everything to the letter. I won't let you down, Aunt Beth. You're a good boy, Sam. You really are, said Aunt Beth, taking out a tissue from her purse and blowing her nose into it very hard. For a moment, Sam thought his aunt was actually crying. He could tell for her the idea of leaving Billy in the house under his charge was something Aunt Beth was loath to do. But it wasn't as if she had a choice in the matter. In the end, I think she thought it was better her 16-year-old nephew look after her child than a childminder she knew absolutely nothing about. It's just, she stuttered anxiously, if anything bad were to happen to little Billy, I'd never forgive myself, never. Do you understand that, Sam? The look on Sam's aunt's face was very solemn. It made Sam feel a tad apprehensive about having agreed to be babysitting his seven-year-old cousin. But it was only for one evening. I mean, what could possibly go wrong during one evening of babysitting? Aunt Beth was so overly cautious when it came to scrupulously watching over little Billy that even his mother Julie said she was over the top. That sister of mine worries about everything, she had told Sam. She might have a lot of money, you know. But she has no peace. She's always frantically worrying that something bad is going to happen to little Billy. I tell her she needs to relax and let her hair down from time to time. We can't police our children 24-7. But you know what your aunt's like. It was true. Aunt Beth was obsessed over Billy's safety and welfare. She was like a mother elephant that would trample on anyone coming near her young. On one occasion, Aunt Beth thought a stranger in the supermarket queue who was standing behind her at the checkout was looking at her son inappropriately. She had instantly believed the man was a predator. You heard so much these days, didn't you? About young children being abducted and the undercover, guileful child trafficking that was taking place around the globe that no one seemed to want to talk about. So alarmed was Aunt Beth that she had promptly abandoned her shopping trolley in the middle of her shop, in a blind panic. Then she'd hightailed it straight back to her car, carrying four-year-old Billy on her hip, while leaving the woman at the checkout, looking somewhat bemused. To her horror, she found the stranger who'd been behind her in the supermarket queue, whom she had tried to escape, was now running after her, waving her down. "'Excuse me, ma'am!' he was calling her. "'Excuse me, ma'am!' Go away, she had cried. Get away from me, will you? She had flapped her hands around like a frantic seagull, as if trying to escape the clutches of a resolutely determined coyote. Ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you. I was wondering, is this your son's by any chance? The man had said breathlessly, rushing up to the car and handing her the little toy aeroplane. I think this might possibly belong to your son. I noticed he was playing with the plane in the supermarket queue. Then he dropped it, because he got distracted by packets of red licorice on offer. Oh, that is his. Thank you so very much, said Aunt Beth, growing as red as a beetroot. She took the aeroplane from the kind stranger rather bashfully.
and handed it back to her four-year-old son. What do you say to this kind gentleman, Billy, for giving you back your aeroplane? You were too busy getting distracted by the red licorice to know that you'd actually dropped it on the supermarket floor. Thank you, sir, Billy had said. I didn't even know I'd left it behind. I love my aeroplane. Well, I wanted to give it back to its rightful owner, said the man. He looked at Aunt Beth kindly and said, Ma'am, I'm dreadfully sorry. I didn't mean to scare you by running after you like I did. But I didn't want your son to lose his aeroplane. When I was his age, I would have been absolutely mortified to lose such a quality toy like this. Not that I had many toys. By the looks of things, it's a very special aeroplane. Little Billy boasted, I can fly it, sir. I'm sure you can, said the man. He shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly. I noticed you forgot your shopping back there, ma'am. You didn't finish buying your stuff. But I told the teller you were probably in a tearing hurry and remembered something you needed to do. That's happened to me before in the middle of a shop, I have to say. You're absolutely right about that. That's exactly what happened. I remember there was something I had to do. She lied. How could she tell this kind gentleman that she'd run away from him? because she had assumed he was looking at her son inappropriately. "'I'd better get back to my shopping, ma'am,' the man said. "'Have a good day.' "'Same to you,' she had said rather sheepishly. Aunt Beth had felt so dreadfully ashamed to overreact in the way she'd done, but that's what happens when you're overly protective towards your children. You allow an untethered imagination to get the better of you, and allow yourself to believe that anybody else's intentions towards your offspring... Are nefarious. But of course, Aunt Beth, Sam had reassured his aunt, for what must have been the zillionth time. I promise you, you've got nothing to worry about at all. I told you, for the hundredth time, I'll take great care of Cousin Billy. I'm a night owl anyway. It's no problem for me to stay awake all night and watch over him. If it makes you feel better, I'll do just that, and I'll call you if I need to. His Aunt Beth had taken his hand and given it a tight squeeze. Oh, I'm so relieved to hear you say that. Your mother was right about you, Sam. You're a dependable young man, even if you are only 16. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be accompanying my husband to his best friend's 40th birthday party. It's only because I can trust in you to take good care of little Billy that I've actually decided to go. Your uncle really wants me to go with him. To this party, you see. He's got to do a speech for his very best friend. They grew up together, you know. He's feeling rather nervous and apprehensive about it. So I need to be there to support him. Cheer him along, if you know what I mean. But why is he nervous, Aunt Beth? I didn't know Uncle Dylan would be nervous about anything. Uncle Dylan is so accomplished and successful. I didn't think anything would intimidate him. That's what your uncle probably wants people to believe. He's a self-made success story. But just like anyone else, he also has his insecurities, you know. But he hides them well. Do you know, Billy, that some people find public speaking is one of the most terrifying things to do? And it's like that for your uncle. But I dare say he will deliver that speech very well and overcome his fear, as he always does. But I promise you, while he's doing his speech, all these people will think that he is so confident and self-assured. But in reality, his heart will be flapping like a bird's when it's caught in a cat's jaws. That's how terrified he will be. I can assure you of that. Well, I don't blame Uncle Dylan for being terribly afraid of public speaking, said Sam reflectively. I hate standing up in front of the class and doing a speech. But in front of a hundred people at a party, that's a huge deal. But I'm sure Uncle Dylan will do a fine speech. I have faith in him. I'm in no doubt he will deliver a very good speech indeed, Aunt Beth agreed. I share your confidence in him, Sam. Anyway, the great news is, next time you come to stay with us here, I will have an alarm installed so you can get some good sleep while minding Billy. I should have had an alarm installed a long time ago, but I kept putting it off. We did have a few alarm companies coming around to the house, but I couldn't for the life of me decide which one to choose, 
so in the end we didn't go with any of them, and I deeply regret that now. But why would you need to get an alarm, Aunt Beth? It's safe around here, isn't it? I mean, if you were living in Detroit where I live, well, I could understand you getting an alarm. Lots of people have alarms there. But out here there's a tiny population, probably zero crime. So what are you worrying about? You can never be too careful, Sam. Wherever you live in the world, I don't even care where it is. Especially if you have valuable stuff in your home, which we do. I learnt the importance of being vigilant a long time ago, you know. I know you think I'm probably very silly and overwrought. But you know, after I came so close to losing little Billy, never again. Can you understand what I'm saying, Sam? You don't have to explain anything to me, Aunt Beth. I do understand, said Sam politely. He knew exactly why Aunt Beth was so protective over little Billy. Not only because he was the only child she'd ever have, but on one occasion her little boy had nearly drowned in their pond when Beth had turned her back on him for what must have seemed like a few seconds, when distracted by a phone call from the man who was coming over to the house to repair their washing machine that was spraying water all over the kitchen floor and creating a catastrophic mess. Little Billy had been four years old at the time. Aunt Beth did not know how little Billy had fallen into the water, but she had dived in after him unhesitantly, wearing long leather boots and a glamorous navy blue silk blouse. She feared the worst, she had searched for her son frantically in the dark, murky water with a feeling of ominous dread consuming her, for she knew that it would only take minutes for her child to drown, and the thought of losing Billy after everything she'd gone through to have him was utterly dreadful, too dreadful to contemplate. She cursed herself for how long she'd been distracted by that phone call with the plumber, talking about a meaningless washing machine that she believed he had installed incredibly badly. It must have been longer than she had imagined. She had felt an icy chill of water seeping through her clothes as she navigated her way through the water, guided only by her instincts to propel her towards her little son. In seconds she had located him and pulled his limp, lifeless body out of the pond. In a trice she began to administer CPR on him, and thankfully little Billy began to regurgitate the water from his lungs by coughing and spluttering. Aunt Beth had been so relieved to hear a noise coming out of her son's throat, because it meant he was alive. She had been unable to believe that he had come so close to losing his tiny little life, and even the emergency services said as much. They said that she was very lucky that her son had survived. Once the emergency services assured Aunt Beth that Billy would live to see another day, she realised how close she'd come to losing him, and from thenceforth, had refused to trust anyone in his charge. Aunt Beth was very glamorous, slender and attractive. She sometimes looked like a fish out of water in the Michigan countryside, because regardless of the weather, be it rain, sleet or shine, Aunt Beth looked immaculately turned out, as if she was about to take a casual stroll down the red carpet in Hollywood. She was one of those glamorous women that looked good every single day of the week. When she was growing up in the Tennessee countryside, she had scant clothes in her wardrobe because her parents were not well off. So maybe her privileged wardrobe and the freedom to wear whatever she chose was something she did not want to take for granted. Sam privately suspected that if the fire brigade arrived at Aunt Beth's in the middle of the night, she would likely greet the fireman looking as if she'd stepped out of a bandbox. Aunt Beth always smelt of roses and Sam loved the way she smelt. She wore the fragrance Paris by Yves Saint Laurent. Obstensibly, Sam would always know his aunt was around when he smelled roses. In truth, he thought she owned the scent, as if it was her signature. But it did suit her, as Aunt Beth was described by many as the quintessential English rose. Sam's mother, Julia, was the antithesis to her sister in every regard. Sam's mother had grown up to be a tomboy who had loved climbing trees and roughing it, and all these years later... Unlike her sister Beth, she was quite happy to wear sweatshirts and jeans every single day of the week without exception, and never took much pleasure in dressing up for a special occasion. She never went to the hairdresser, but cut her hair herself, and although Julie looked good, she made no effort with her appearance, and had never worn perfume a day in her life, and probably didn't want to anyway. 
Sam noticed that while he'd been on babysitting duty on this lonely Saturday evening, where the house had seemed almost airily quiet, something had jolted him out of his sleep and disturbed him. But what it was, he didn't know. He was sure he'd heard a strange thumping noise, but wondered if he'd imagined it all, or whether the intrusive noise had all been part of his dream. He glanced down at the luxurious sweep of red woollen carpet beneath his feet, where the dog-eared book he'd been reading had slipped out of his hands and landed on the thick velvety red pile like a dead bird with wings outstretched, almost as if the position of the book was prognostic, warning of an ominous omen of things to come that night that nothing would prepare him for had he been aware of what was about to happen. Even though Sam was not an avid or voracious reader like his uncle Dylan so obviously was, he was naturally fascinated by the ornate library in his aunt's home, with its stunning walnut bookshelves that magnanimously lined the walls of the room, and some of them reached the ceiling and could only be accessed by a beautifully carved wooden ladder. There was a vast collection of books hidden behind a glass cabinet that was always locked. Some of them were so new that they'd never actually been opened and were only handled wearing gloves to preserve the quality of these old, highly revered, treasured masterpieces of literature. Sam was always warned never to touch the locked glass cabinet. Uncle Dylan told him, These books are highly collectible, Sam, worth an absolute fortune. They are a book collector's dream, and there are some unscrupulous book collectors out there that would love to get their hands on some of these masterpieces. While Sam fully appreciated that Uncle Dylan's collection of books was nothing short of impressive, he couldn't fully understand why some of them were worth so much money, and why his uncle seemed to take great pride in these treasures, collecting them like some people collect art or gold bullion. This stunning library with its cosy seating arrangements of leather couches, a cherry wood coffee table, and a wonderful ornate marble fireplace, where fires would crackle merrily away on a cold winter's night. The library's favourite boast, of course, was the never-ending vast volumes of books, many covered in leather, and looked like they were worth a pretty penny. The print in some of the books was so spectacular and was like nothing Sam had ever seen before. The truth was Sam knew little to nothing about books, and although he naturally admired his Uncle Dylan's vast collection, he could not comprehend why his uncle was so fixated with all things literary. Sam loved relaxing in the library. It was situated adjacent to the staircase in the hallway and was not too far away from little Billy's bedroom upstairs. So it was Aunt Beth that decided that he should remain in the library while he was on babysitting duty, so that should Billy call out to him, he would hear his cousin. It seemed like a good place for him to hang out on this evening. Earlier on in the evening, Sam had spotted something rather peculiar sticking out between two very elegant books in one of the bookshelves that looked like it shouldn't be there. He had wondered what the obstruction was, for whatever it was, it looked out of place. Sam gingerly pulled the thing out, only to discover that the item that he was now studying in his hands was a rather threadbare, bedraggled and beaten down old book that looked like it was falling apart at the seams as if the old glue that held the book together was now badly fractured. More out of curiosity than anything else, he had opened the weather-beaten old book to read the inside cover. There was child's handwriting on the inside that read, This book belongs to Elisa Hemingway. Next to her name was the date, June the 1st, 1982. Sam had no idea who this mystery girl was, for there was no one in his family with the name Elisa but she had clearly underlined her favourite parts in the book in a bright red fountain pen that was beginning to fade. The book was written by Enid Blyton. He'd heard about Enid Blyton growing up, so out of curiosity he had taken the book along to the leather couch and settled down to read it. What was it his father had told him of once about Enid Blyton? In my day, Enid Blyton was all the rage. In my opinion, Harry Potter doesn't hold a candle to her. Enid Blyton wrote incredible mystery stories about five young kids with smugglers and underground hidden tunnels. Stuff like that. Her work was masterful. So much better than magic spells and broomsticks as far as I'm concerned, his father had said. 
Sam had thought that after reading two pages just for the hell of it, to keep himself busily entertained, as there wasn't really much to do. So why not? He thought he'd soon grow bored. The truth was Sam had not been able to put the Enid Blyton book down, which was something he would never ever admit to any of his friends. It would absolutely ruin his street cred. He found himself getting entangled and caught up in a mystery story that had beguiled children from the 70s and 80s, but now it had drawn him right in, hook, line and sinker, as it had done to earlier generations of children. Sam could see what his father was getting at, for Enid Blyton's books were like thrillers for children, and in his humble opinion, yes, they were better than broomsticks and magic spells, even though they were written in another time, to another audience. Yet they still seemed to reach out to Sam's generation, in a magical way, which meant they were classics. Sam had never been a big reader. Concentrating was always difficult for him. So a tiredness had begun to seep in, and he had drifted off to sleep. How on earth had he allowed that to happen? Why couldn't he even get this right? Was it so dreadfully hard to just stay awake for a few hours for his Aunt Beth's sake? Sam had faithfully promised his Aunt Beth that he'd keep his eyes pinned on his cousin Billy, and he had intended to keep his word by checking on his cousin every twenty minutes or so. But after he had closed his eyes for just a moment, he had fallen fast asleep, despite having drunk three cups of coffee that evening to stay awake. But he had failed to realise the coffee in question that he'd been drinking was all decaffeinated. It would seem Aunt Beth was very particular about the food she drank and ate, which was one of the distinct advantages of having money. The family always brought organic vegetables and grass-fed meat, which might have been one of the reasons Aunt Beth didn't look a day over thirty, when she was already forty-two years old. It would seem his mother had not managed to look as young as her sister. Sam's mum had a much harder life than Aunt Beth clearly did, and it showed vividly on her face, that was rather unfortunately mapped out, with the faint beginnings of fine lines that each year were steadily growing deeper and deeper, and more pronounced. In Sam's private opinion, both his mother Julia and Aunt Beth were decidedly ancient, but he'd never tell them that, of course. It was rude to tell adults that you thought they were pretty decrepit. The idea of being forty absolutely horrified Sam. He couldn't envisage what it would be like to be that old, but like any teenager, he foolishly believed forty years old was a long way off in the distant future, a whole galaxy away. He had little comprehension of how fast time actually flies. His mother had told him often enough to enjoy being sixteen, because it wouldn't last for very long, and before he knew it, he'd be married with a wife and kids, wondering where all the time had gone to. Sam's mother Julia had persuaded his Aunt Beth that Sam was up to doing the job of being an excellent babysitter for his cousin Billy. "'Sam has grown up to be such a reliable young man,' she assured her sister Beth. "'Let him stay over at your place, Beth, on Saturday night, and babysit little Billy for you. I assure you, you are not going to be remotely disappointed. Your little boy could not be in safer hands. You can trust my Sam with your life. But it's a big responsibility, surely, for a sixteen-year-old to watch over his cousin.' Aunt Beth had said rather scathingly. It's generous, of course, for you to offer, Julia, and I do appreciate it, but it's probably not a great idea. Besides, it's a nine-hour trip from Detroit, and I can't expect you to travel so far. I think it's best I remain at home. Dylan can go to the party on his own without me. I know it's not what he wants. He wants me to be there to support him during his speech, which he's very nervous about delivering. But it just can't be helped. As a mother, I have other responsibilities, not just to my husband, but to my son as well. I need to make sacrifices, and one of them is taking care of little Billy. I don't have an alarm installed at my home yet, and your son will be at home alone with little Billy, and I don't like that. It doesn't sit well with me. Don't be ridiculous, Sam's mother had chortled. My son is 16 years old. He's practically an adult and he's extremely responsible. You need to go to that party, sis, not only to support Dylan, but also because it's good for you to get out and socialise for a change. My guess is you've not been out since Billy was born. Am I right, or am I right? 
Well, I guess I haven't socialised for three years or so, after Billy nearly drowned in the pond. I could have lost him, sis. And I've never been able to forgive myself for that. That incident made me become extremely guarded. And that's understandable, sis. I get it. I really do. But every mother needs a break watching over her child. And you're no exception to that rule, you know. It'd actually do you the world of good to have a break. Sam is a capable young man. Very capable indeed. He's mature for his age. He's got an old head on young shoulders, let me tell you. Billy will be very safe in his charge. I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't trust my son 100%. Believe me, after he's watched over Billy for you, you'll be asking him to do it for you again and again. He won't let you down, sis. I can promise you of that. You really think I can trust a 16-year-old to watch over my son? Aunt Beth had asked her sister. I'm not terribly sure about this. So there we are. That is the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.